Right, well, today we've got Jeff Beck coming to us from the University of Vardasarant, and he's gonna tell us about uh, dark matter in the EOR. Over to you, Jeff. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for hosting me for this. So uh, lots of, I need to preface this by saying that lots of the hard work that was in this talk wasn't done by me, it was done by my master's student, um, Paul, who's here in the, uh, in the meeting at the moment. So I just have to embarrass him. Um, so just some context for this seminar. I'm going to be talking about the period of transition um, of the universe out of the cosmic dark ages. So from a neutral uh, sort of lightless universe to the, the present day universe we know at the moment. And of course, um, moving further from uh, a long time ago, uh, the present universe today is ionized. And this uh, fact was initially established by Gunn and Peterson in the 1960s. Uh, and they did this by noting that um, if, by looking at light from distant sources, so quasars in this case, and if you had almost any hydrogen, neutral hydrogen on the line of sight, it would absorb very strongly in the Lyman alpha regime. And what they noticed was that all of the quasars they could see, which were only about a reg of two or so, uh, didn't have any of the sign of this absorption. And we have a picture of what it would look like here, the so-called Gunn-Peterson trough, where uh, we go from having emission uh, uh, in uh, this Lyman band to having absolutely nothing in this uh, trough here, which is because it's all being absorbed by this neutral hydrogen cloud on the line of sight. And the fact that they didn't see these troughs indicated that the universe had to be almost totally ionized. So that kind of runs contrary to a very simple uh, Big Bang uh, evolution where you, or a purely thermal evolution where your expansion cools the universe. And of course, cool universes are neutral. So um, it meant that the neutral dark ages universe where everything was neutral had to have been re-ionized. Now, the big questions that come along with this is uh, what kind of stuff does the ionizing, um, over what kind of period does it happen and what are the mechanisms uh, that allow this to proceed? So uh, the sort of summary diagram that's usually presented for ionization is something like this. We have the formation of the CMB at about redshift 1000. And then uh, after a very long period of cosmic dark ages, we, this ends with uh, the formation of the first stars. Okay, So the first stars are drivers of early reionization. Little patches of ionized gas build up around these stars. The stars clump up to galaxies, and eventually the galaxies ionize the entire universe. Okay, but the, so this all happens over a relatively short period. It starts around redshift 30 and it's done by about redshift six. So this is the kind of epoch we're going to be concentrating on um, in this seminar today. So there's quite a lot of evidence that um, the epoch of ionization happened, apart from the fact that the universe is ionized today. Okay. Uh, for instance, we can observe more quasars, and we've seen quasars way further out than the initial, stud initial studies by people like Gunn and Peterson ever saw. Um, quasars below redshift six don't have a Gunn-Peterson trough. That indicates that they aren't large clouds of neutral hydrogen on the line of sight. And because hydrogen is such a good absorber, we can say that um, up to redshift six, basically the whole universe is ionized. If we go beyond redshift six, the quasars start to show Gunn-Peterson troughs. So the universe starts to have neutral hydrogen around in some abundance above this redshift of six. Uh, particularly, uh, one of the furthest quasars that's been observed at about redshift seven uh, limits the fraction of ionized hydrogen then to about 60%. So we can say with some confidence that around redshift six or seven, reionization is underway. The universe is turning from neutral into a completely uh, ionized state. We can also look to the CMB for evidence of reionization. Uh, the CMB formed at redshift 1000. And so the photons that are coming to us from that event will have passed through the epoch of reionization themselves. And of course, if you pass through uh, a large number of free electrons, as you would in an ionized universe, those electrons will be scattered. And that Thomson scattering will imprint itself in a polarization pattern on the CMB. Um, so what we can do is work out uh, how many collisions the CMB photons would have experienced, judging by their state of po observed polarization, uh, this being the optical depth. And this will tell us how far away in redshift terms this 
reionization event was. Okay, and there have been various measurements of this optical depth over time, increasing their precision till we get to the most modern Planck measurements. And we can use this to determine when the universe ionization was complete. This is a slightly simplified integral, just to give the gist of what's going on. Um, it depends really on uh, the baryon. I've got here the baryon number density in the present epoch um, and with a, uh, a fraction that's ionized. Okay, this will essentially be one at redshift smaller than ZR. And we can use our measured value of tau to solve for ZR. And what we find from the Planck measurement is that this is round about seven. So all of this information is lining up, uh, that, re that reionization was roughly complete somewhere around redshift six or seven. Now, um, there's another tool we can use uh, to gather evidence about the epoch of ionization or evidence for its occurrence, and that's the 21 centimeter line of neutral hydrogen. This occurs because hydrogen has two ground states, and they're separated. They're, it's a hyperfine splitting. One of them has the spins pointing in the same direction, and one has the spin of the proton and the electron antiparallel. Now, the antiparallel configuration is very slightly lower in energy, uh, but because these are both ground states and have the same um, orbital angular momentum, this is a forbidden transition. So it proceeds very slowly, but it has a very definite frequency and is a very narrow line. So it's a very good indicator of the presence of neutral hydrogen. Um, and this, uh, the emission that occurs during the spin flip has a wavelength of almost exactly 21 centimeters. And because there's lots of neutral hydrogen before the epoch of ionization, and it disappears during the epoch, and there's almost none now, it makes a great indicator of the history of this epoch. Now, we usually characterize um, this 21 centimeter emission via the so-called spin temperature. Um, this is not a real temperature. Uh, well, not strictly speaking. Uh, it's really just a relationship between the occupation numbers of the excited uh, or the, uh, the triplet ground state of hydrogen and the singlet ground state. So the, uh, the higher energy state and the lower energy state respectively. Okay, so it gives essentially a measure of how bright the emission is from the 21 centimeter transition. Uh, now, this, this would be the simple expression in terms of this exponential if our hydrogen were in isolation. But of course, uh, nothing in the universe is really in isolation. Uh, the CMB perm is all over the place, and or, or at least after CMB is formed. And so this means that photon, uh, pho there'll be a constant interaction between CMB photons and the neutral hydrogen. Remember that the spin flip transition has a radio frequency, um, has radio, roughly a radio frequency. So we're going to get a constant interaction between this neutral hydrogen and the CMB, and this will drive the spin temperature towards the temperature of the CMB. Um, so what we tend to use as a measure of neutral hydrogen emission, we tend to measure it as a distortion on the cosmic microwave background. And we do that by measuring a differential temperature. And this very roughly uh, depends upon a product of the fraction of the hydrogen that is neutral and the difference in temperature between the, uh, the emission itself and the CMB. So ionizing radiation in particular, there are a couple of effects that affect, a couple of things that drive this difference in temperature. Ionizing radiation uh, couples our spin temperature to the temperature of the gas itself, because this ionizing radiation can essentially, well, not ionizing radiation, but it should be, I should have said ex exciting radiation <laughs> rather than ionizing. Um, but if you excite neutral hydrogen, you can induce a spin flip in it. There are allowed transitions that go from one of the ground states to an, to an excited state and back down into the ground state of the opposite spin. So we can drive these spin flips um, through, uh, uh, through a higher energy radiation, energy uh, substantially higher than the 21 centimeter emission itself. Uh, and this pushes us uh, through resonance scattering to a similar temperature to the gas. Okay, for the spin temperature. Uh, similarly, collisions between particles in the gas can also drive this temperature of this 21 centimeter emission to be similar to the gas temperature. Okay, so they're competing effects here. The CMB is always trying to force the spin temperature of the 21 centimeter emission to be the same as itself, and various effects will push the spin temperature instead towards the temperature of the gas. And it's worth noting the temperature of the gas will usually be, at least in the earlier universe, below the temperature of the CMB. 
So when these effects are dominant earlier on, we expect the temperature, this differential temperature to be negative, okay? And a complete ionization, it's worth noting, will drive our fraction of neutral hydrogen to zero and therefore kill off any difference between these temperatures. We'll no longer see a distortion due to neutral hydrogen on the CMD, CMB spectrum. Okay, so essentially what we're saying here is that troughs, uh, periods of negativity in, um, or, and sometimes positivity, uh, so above and below uh, the temperature of the CMB, will signal the process of reionization. And we can see that graphically represented in something like this, where we're running redshift um, from the left to the right. Okay, so uh, earlier times are on the right and we're going towards the present universe, uh, sorry, earlier times on the left going towards the present universe on the right. And in the dark ages, we have uh, a trough here where our temperature is below the temperature of the CMB. And that's because uh, collisional coupling, the density is high enough for, for the collisional coupling to dominate here. As we progress on uh, later on, the collisional coupling becomes less effective because the gas is less dense. So uh, the CMB starts to win and we head towards no distortion at all. Uh, afterwards, uh, once stars and galaxies are forming, there's lots of ionization, ionizing exciting radiation floating around in the universe. And this will, again, through resonance scattering, push the temperature down towards the temperature of the gas. Okay, so it can produce a, a potentially larger trough here. This trough is pretty much always this size. This trough here is very dependent upon your sources of, um, he of heating and radiation, and we'll talk more about that as we go along. Uh, and we can see here, once we reach the point where reionization is beginning, we're actually in an emission here. We have a higher temperature than the CMB in our 21 centimeter, and that's because our stars and galaxies are pumping heat into the neutral gas. So the neutral gas is getting very hot, emitting loads of 21 centimeter, becoming brighter than the CMB. And by the time reionization ends, we drop back to zero because we just don't have any neutral hydrogen left. Okay, so there are quite a few competing effects going on. What we're gonna be mainly interested in is the sources of radiation that influence these troughs and peaks in the differential brightness temperature. So, um, these troughs and peaks are signals of the epoch of reionization and how reionization is proceeding. Uh, importantly, that, for that large trough at about redshift 20 signals the onset of reionization, okay, all the processes that are going to start reionizing the universe, the formations of stars and galaxies, or whatever energy injection mechanism you please. Uh, interestingly, the EDGES experiment has seen a trough at redshift 18. Okay, I can't give a talk on the epoch of ionization without edges, which is the elephant in the room, despite being quite small. Um, so uh, this is a picture of the edges experiment. We can have a look at the picture of what it saw uh, over here. So we've got, this is just a snippet of that global spectrum we saw earlier, particularly the point redshift 17 here. And we can see that there's a very deep trough. Now note this goes all the way to minus, to minus a half on this axis. If we flip back to the previous one, uh, this was in millikelvin. This is only going down to about 0.1. Okay, so that edges trough is pretty damn deep. It's about five times deeper than a fiducial model would expect. And uh, you can see here these fainter lines are just a family of possible realizations of the spectrum. And try as we might, uh, it's very hard to generate anything that even gets halfway as deep as the trough seen by edges. So something strange is going on here. It may just be experimental, but there could be some interesting physics here. Um, there's some particular features of the trough that are worth mentioning. Uh, so edges is indicating to us, for the fact the trough is deep and sharp edged, that there's some very intense star formation activity that's driving this, because it's, it's very rapid reionization, which gives these, um, these sharp edges to the trough. Okay, so we have very rapid onset, very intense reionization, and the depth is telling us that if this is not just an experimental effect, of course, that uh, the, the IGM, the, the, our intergalactic medium, was much colder than expected before the epoch of reionization. So perhaps that requires some new physics, and there have been various models suggested, various things involving interactions with dark matter and baryons various other ideas. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that surprisingly. Uh, I've got other points of interest for dark matter in the epoch of reionization. I just thought I should get edges out the way. So the, so the things that drive reionization, at least in terms of conventional, what we call standard astrophysics here, um, will uh, be things like stars. So in the dark ages, the gas in the universe is cooling. 
and structure formation has begun because we've passed out of the radiation dominated epoch. So dark matter in the conventional picture is forming potential wells into which this gas, cooling gas can fall. And because it's cooling, we're, we're at relatively low kinetic energy, we can start building up dense enough clumps for star formation to begin. So we're really at the cusp of star formation as the dark ages, uh, which will bring the end to the dark ages. Uh, the early stars, the so-called POP3 stars, uh, are meant to be formed of helium and hydrogen exclusively. So they're enormous and uh, extremely bright. They've got surface temperatures about 100 times that of the sun. Uh, so they're great at outputting ionizing radiation. So these are going to be uh, one of the primary engines of reionization in the early universe. The other one is going to be AGNs, because uh, these enormous stars uh, will burn out quickly. Big st so st stars, big stars burn out quickly, they die young, and uh, because they're so big, lots of them are going to leave black holes behind. Okay, uh, and accretion is a very around black holes is a very efficient X-ray source. So the buildup of large black holes in this epoch and their accretion is going to be a major source of X-rays. And these X-rays are excellent at ionizing universes. A, they're in the kind of frequency range you want. B, they travel very far in the IGM. They have a much longer mean free path than something like ultraviolet radiation, which is the bulk of what's going to be coming out of those stars that we can uh, use for reionization. So uh, the source of reionization that I'm interested in at the moment is dark matter. How would dark matter go about producing reionization? Well, particle dark matter uh, could theoretically annihilate or decay in which case it will produce standard model particles. And these standard model particles can go on to interact with this neutral hydrogen gas, or um, maybe the CMB and photon fields in the early universe. And this allows us to deposit heat into the neutral gas itself. Not only that, if the energy emissions are high enough energy, we can have ionization or excitation as well. So we can essentially do everything that stars or AGN are doing with dark matter too. And this is uh, convenient because at the same time that reionization is meant to be happening, the conditions that allow star formation to start, the formation of these potential wells, also means that the dark matter density is becoming much larger inside these pro first proto-galaxies. Okay? And that's going to greatly amplify the signal from annihilations or decays. Yeah, so annihilation here, just this classic diagram for your three different directions for detecting dark matter. We're interested in the annihilation case where we go from two dark matter particles, chi, to some standard model uh, stable particles. Okay, so there are big questions that come out of uh, re this sort of overview of reionization. Um, how important are stars and X-rays, respectively? So how much work do they do in this realization? How much room is there for dark matter to contribute? And more importantly, uh, is, this, is the turn on centimeter uh, and the epoch of realization an effective probe of new physics, of additional energy injection beyond simply uh, stars and X-rays? Okay, and another interesting question to which the conventional answer is often no is can uh, or not easily is, uh, can, X, can SKA and HERA perform these probes? So we'll look at some arguments later as to why it might be possible to probe the global 21 centimeter background, which is our probe of choice for dark matter here, with uh, an interferometer, like our HERA and SKA low pictured below. So um, some preliminaries before we start talking more uh, to make sure everyone's on the same page. When we discuss a dark matter model, we're quite general. We don't go into real specifics about something like supersymmetry or whatever. We tend to keep it as general as possible. And that means the a model has three characteristics. It has a mass, okay, a particle mass for the dark matter. Uh, we can have an annihilating or decaying model. Uh, for an annihilating model, we have the cross section or which roughly functions as an annihilation rate, right? It's an annihilation rate. It's a sort of volume annihilation rate. It's got funny units. And finally, we can have an annihilation channel. So two dark matter particles collide, annihilate, and produce some standard model particles X. The annihilation channel is whatever the particle X actually is. So it could be a tau lepton, or a bottom quark, or a muon, or an electron, right? So uh, we've got those three properties for an annihilating case. So analogously three for a decaying case, except we have a plain old decay rate, and we just go from a single dark matter particle to some standard model stuff. 
Okay, so in general, I'll just refer to annihilation um, models, uh, but almost everything I say will apply to decaying cases as well. Their physics doesn't change enormously. So, um, why do I bother considering dark matter at all? I mean, it looks like there's plenty of stuff going on in the epoch of reionization, uh, plenty of stars, plenty of AGNs, stuff that can power uh, reionization itself. Uh, why do I need to go about sticking exotic stuff like dark matter in and complicating the issue? Well, um, so dark matter, as I mentioned, we're in an epoch where first halos are forming. So the density is going up. That gives an enhancement to an, something like an annihilation signal because it means there's more dark matter closer together, easier to bump into each other. And uh, the production of energy that will be absorbed by the IgM from dark matter is so natural. There are lots of mechanisms by which this can proceed. Uh, we can have electrons being produced by the annihilation. Those electrons can, uh, through inverse Compton scattering, produce X-rays and gamma rays. And these are fantastic at ionizing, exciting, and heating the neutral gas. Uh, we also procopiously produce photons during dark matter annihilation, and those will have similar effects. So dark matter can have a very powerful effect, but in order to illustrate this to you, I'm going to show you uh, a slightly old paper now from 2009, uh, at least their main results. And these graphs might be mean absolutely nothing um, to you at first glance, but what they're used for in this paper, whose archive number I mentioned here, is to argue that dark matter alone is sufficient to perform all of the universe's reionization. You wouldn't actually need stars, okay? You can do all of the heating, all of the reionization, just with uh, dark matter annihilations alone. And this doesn't require some kind of outlandish model. These are just dark matter annihilating via V quarks and with the so-called thermal relic cross-section here, the sigma V. Um, and this value is important because it's the annihilation rate you need to land up with the amount of dark matter we observe today. So you could call this a, ben a sort of reasonable benchmark for the annihilation rate. And the fact that you can achieve this in uh, incredible result is a bit suspicious. Let's admit that, okay? Um, but it, it gives an illustration of the fact that uh, dark matter has incredible power to influence the history of reionization in the universe. So this is kind of like the motivation um, for including dark matter in this epoch at all. And the, another aspect of the motivation is that the 21 centimeter line is so sensitive to extra energy, especially at around redshift 20. So if there is more energy than we're expecting or different history of energy being dumped in, the turnaround centimeter is going to give us a good uh, means to probe that. So how do they determine um, that dark matter can supply all of this, all of the reionization for our universe? Well, there are two couple differential equations that go into this. They're quite simple in form here because we're hiding all the nastiness in these terms. Uh, one here is for the fraction of ionized electrons, Xe, and one is for the temperature of the gas, Tk. Okay. Um, these, we have some standard terms that we're not going to worry too much about because they're not the subject of this talk. These are our recombination and ionization rates from just normal physics, let's say. We have an additional contribution of ionization from dark matter. Then in our heating equation, we've got some standard heating and we've got some dark matter heating. Now the forms of these terms are very important. Okay, we're working with the global signal, the global averaged homogeneous 21 centimeter background. So these terms are very simple. They just consist of the essentially the amount of energy dumped in per annihilation, uh, and then the number of annihilations uh, per unit volume per second. Okay, which is the number density squared times by the cross section. So this is a very simple form. So you might be wondering where the nasty physics is, and the answer is in here. Okay, this function f. Okay, what this guy does is in practice tells us or is used to represent the fraction of energy from an annihilation that actually goes into something like ionization. And that is as hard to work out as it sounds. Okay, uh, you have to sit there with huge Monte Carlo simulations and work out. Uh, uh, you have to sort of, you start with particles being generated from dark matter annihilation and then watch all the possible things they could do. Uh, will they bump into hydrogen, give it some energy? Will they produce a photon that goes off to excite some hydrogen? Uh, you know, so long, long chains of processes that are going on here. Um, similarly, we have uh, very simple physics for the heating term and all of the nastiness incorporated into this efficiency function. Okay, that's what these are termed efficiency functions. 
And we generally write them just as functions of redshift. In principle, they're functions of energy too. Often we just average them over the energy spectrum of the dark matter model we're considering itself, in which case it'll just depend upon redshift. But if the dark matter is cold, obviously the, um, the particles won't vary in energy over time. So uh, this makes a very acceptable approximation. Uh, but these guys are the important part. This is what I want to illustrate. All of the physics that I'm going to be that I'm discussing here comes down to these efficiency functions. How well does dark matter dump energy into the neutral gas? And um, you can see that uh, this is essentially the, the mechanism we're going to be using to, uh, to follow all of this, this spin temperature of the neutral hydrogen. Uh, so this will gravitate to the CMB temperature if left to its own devices. Um, otherwise, we have a coupling, a Lyman alpha coupling, and a, uh, or of the Votasen field effect, and um, a collisional coupling. Okay. In this, so the, obviously the dark matter we've mentioned can affect the history, in which case it will change the ionized fraction of the universe and the gas temperature, but it can also affect this coupling value here. It doesn't really, it doesn't change the collisional coupling very much. It mostly has an effect on the Lyman alpha coupling here because it can add additional photons in the Lyman alpha frequency range. And that can uh, adjust that initial trough of that trough at Z is equal to 20. So this is going to be the metric we're going to judge things by. Um, again, we'll have a very simple form for uh, the Lyman alpha contribution of dark matter. Um, we have a, a, a bunch of simple terms here, just some hydrogen densities, a Hubble constant, an energy injection rate, which will be just the same, that simple form as we had in the previous slides, uh, where we had these very simple multiplications of a couple of terms, and again, an efficiency function. And this guy, again, will be the most important factor here. Okay. Um, now, to keep things simple and reduce the number of parameters, we are not going to you uh, include other sources of Lyman alpha, and we'll discuss why we do this and uh, whether or not it'll be a problem later. Okay, so we're essentially only going to use uh, the isotropic uh, uh, effect of the isotropic um, ionization fraction and uh, and dark matter itself as our sources of Lyman alpha photons. Okay, so to give you an idea, here's a work that does a similar kind of thing. You can see it's showing off the global 21 centimeter differential brightness again, and there's only one trough, right? There's only one trough at Z is 100. There's no trough occurring at Z is 20, and that's because they're not including the effect of stars or um, AGNs. Okay, all they're looking for is the difference caused between their baseline model and their dark matter models uh, when you stick in the dark matter effects. Here they're talking about sterile neutrinos. The solid lines show off the baseline model, so the case without any dark matter effects. And each of these other lines represents um, a, a, a particular sterile neutrino model. Their, diff their um, exact details aren't important to us here, so I'm not going to go through what they are. All we want to note is that their effects can be really substantial. Okay, and let's note a common trend here. They reduce the depth of this dark ages trough. Okay, and uh, they do that because the dark matter is heating the neutral hydrogen gas and making its emission brighter. Okay, so the primary effect here is one of heating being produced by dark matter. Uh, they can also reduce the Lyman alpha trough, which I put on the wrong slide. It should be on the next one. Because um, in this study here, uh, this 2012 study, um, these guys took a look at uh, both the dark ages trough and a reasonable Lyman alpha trough, uh, assuming stellar and X-ray sources. And you can see that both of them are made shallower by the dark matter models. We have the standard baseline model in black that they're using and various dark matter models in these colored lines. And they've got two different scenarios here just to see if their uh, choice of realization history affects how the dark matter changes things. Okay. And what you can see is that this trough is generally made shallower, similar to the dark ages trough. So the effect, the primary effect dark matter seems to be having here is one of heating. It is injecting extra heat into the gas and thus making these absorption troughs shallower. Okay, um, let's note that uh, though I don't list all the models here because there are quite a lot of them, um, these are quite reasonable models. Uh, and by reasonable, I mean they're again using that thermal relic cross section, that value of the annihilation rate necessary to reproduce the present dark matter abundance. So they're not having to assume very rapid uh, or very exotic uh, um, 
annihilation rates. And they can produce quite substantial effects here. I mean, we're seeing uh, even up to sort of a factor of two reduction in the depth of this uh, Z is 20 trough. So we can have quite substantial effects. Um, some people have gone as far as to use the, because of this, they've gone as far as to constrain dark matter models by uh, saying that, say, edges sees a very deep trough. We remember back, it was like five times deeper than, or, than would be expected or so, or twice as deep as we could possibly expect. Um, and uh, you, you could say, if the trough has to be a certain depth, um, how what kind of dark matter models are allowed that don't um, pull the depth, pull the trough back to being too shallow, okay? So you can say, we know the trough has to be a certain depth. This dark matter model is obviously not acceptable because it would make the trough much shallower than we know it already is, okay? So people have done this kind of thing. Uh, you can see here, they're assuming that the trough's depth has to be over 100 millikelvins, so 0.1 Kelvin. So substantially shallower than the edges trough. Um, but even so, they get rather competitive uh, constraints on the dark matter parameter space. Uh, in order to understand what you're seeing here, this is the annihilation rate on the y-axis and the dark matter mass on the x-axis. And this yellow line here is one of the most important lines on the plot. It is this, uh, this the rate required to reproduce the current dark matter abundance. So if you can push a model below this line, you're saying this model is not viable because it annihilates too slowly and there'd be too much dark matter in the present universe. Okay, so your goal is to push as many models as you can below this line. And as you can see, they do quite well. They have quite a range of the parameter space from say uh, a hundredth of a, a giga electron volt to around 10 giga electron volts. They can constrain um, the mass of dark matter in a couple of different channels. These are the stronger channels, dark matter to photons or electrons, the less optimal channels uh, here in terms of B quarks. So this again relies, all of these results, there's a common theme emerging. They're relying on the heating effect the dark matter has on the neutral gas, okay? Because all of them are taking advantage of the fact that the dark, the heat dark matter is depositing into the 21 cent, onto the neutral hydrogen is um, reducing the absorption trough that you see at round edge of 20, okay? Or the dark edges one, whichever one you're interested in. Um, so that heating is very important. And as I mentioned, all of the physics heavy lifting here is being done by those efficiency functions. So we have to be very careful about those. And perhaps the disturbing thing is that all of these results hinge upon a very, very simple function, okay? The fraction going into heat and into ionization is when the universe is mostly neutral is a third, okay? As simple as that. A third of the dark matter energy is going into heating, a third into ionization, and a third into excitation. Okay, and you might be suspicious of that partitioning, and you should be. Okay, but initial uh, this was even supported by some initial Monte Carlo studies. However, there were issues with the way those were done. The issues were demonstrated in around 2015 for the first time um, that essentially. Uh, lots of photons that people assumed would be going towards heat were actually going to be lost to continuum emission, okay? So the heating is a, a lot less effective than people had assumed it should be. We can see here some plots illustrating this. These are plots of this correction function chi here. So we have a corrected efficiency, an original efficiency, and the correction chi. So the closer chi gets to one, the worse our initial estimate of the efficiency was. And you can see there are some nasty looking stripes across this parameter space. And they're in very inconvenient spots, okay? That'll make uh, your life difficult if you were hinging on the very simple initial estimate of the efficiency functions here. So that's ob obvious problem with previous results, looking at the effect of dark matter in the epoch of reionization. And what we wanted to do was um, to, uh, to fix this, to redo a lot of these results to get more reasonable estimates using updated forms of these efficiency functions. Now, we've also learned a bit about reionization since these plots were made. I mean, Edges has come out with its results. So we kind of want to use updated histories that uh, lean towards a rapid reionization that ends around redshift six. Okay, and there's a third question that I'm that we're interested in here that seems a little bit unrelated, but we'll talk about it just now. Uh, can an interferometer actually detect the global 21 centimeter signal? 
Now, if you're like me and knew nothing about interferometers, you might not even understand the, why this question is being asked, but um, it is essentially that interferometers rely on spatial variation of the signal. If your signal is uniform across the sky, well, then you can't see anything. So global signals are a big no-no, okay? But we'll talk about whether or not this is actually a real problem later. So the first two points that I was interested in here were incorporated into a publicly available code package already called Dark History. Okay, and I'm going to show you a few examples of um, what Dark History is capable of before I get into our actual results. So um, Dark History, uh, the models Dark History uses are designed to be compatible and to be fully self-consistent with a very rapid reionization. Now this graph looks extremely complicated, but this is showing off the heating history that Dark History makes use of in the blue curve here. And you can see it agrees quite well with most of the data points here, except for the ones that are a little bit, uh, these points here are a bit uncertain and involve um, some assumptions about helium heating that may, not, may or may not hold. Okay, so dark history tends to do quite well against these, uh, these low reg of data points. And interestingly, their tests with these self-consistent models suggests that A AGNs do not dominate the process. You can see here the AGN dominated and strongly AGN assisted models here um, are way above the data around redshift four and five. So the mod, uh, what we're considering as our baseline here will be this blue curve for the temperature history of our, uh, of our gas, okay? And we will add dark matter on top of that. Now, uh, we, of course, we'll be using the updated efficiency functions from dark history. So we won't be making the same mistake about assuming too much heating. And um, we can note here just an example of what dark history does, that if we injecting here B, dark matter annihilating into B quarks, with a mass of 50 GeVs for the particle and a cross section around that thermal relic value, we can get some substantial heating, okay? We can also change the ionization history quite substantially around range of 10, okay? Now note there's this additional uh, issue of a back reaction. This is just the introduction of nonlinear effects because obviously injecting energy into the, um, the neutral gas changes all the physics going on. So you have to account for those changes as well. But the back reaction isn't enormously important here. It can be more important in decaying models, but I'm not presenting those results at the moment. But that's just worth noting. So um, let's compare this to the previous results I showed. So if we look back at that 2009 paper, the units are a bit different here, um, but let's, take, uh, let's compare apples to apples at these low redshift numbers. And what we can see is that there's quite a large gulf here around redshift 10 between the, um, between the baseline heating and the dark matter induced heating. Baseline heating in this dotted line, dark matter induced heating options in these dashed and solid lines. And it's a couple of order of magnitude actually. At redshift 10 here, the difference is a factor of a few, okay? The, the, that efficiency correction is enormous, okay? We've gone from a similar, these are very similar models. We've gone from one being able to power the entire reionization of the whole universe on its own to one that just changes the temperature by a factor of a few. Okay, and that's in this case when you don't have any additional heating from stars or anything like that. We've just removed that to uh, make the baseline a bit clearer. So using the actual baseline and computing 21 centimeter results, we can see we get very different results to those original models. Note we haven't included the additional trough here. That's something we're working on at the moment. Uh, the, that additional Lyman alpha trough at around redshift 10, uh, 10 or 20. Um, but the heating effect has been massively reduced. So you can see that the, the dark ages trough is only a tiny bit shallower, okay, uh, with this dark matter model. This is again using the same annihilation rate as those previous plots. So the annihilation channel is only a tiny, uh, I mean, the trough here is only a tiny bit shallower. And this is also using the B quark channels, the same as the previous plots. And uh, note here, instead of reducing this, this effect here is very interesting around redshift 10. Instead of heating the gas and reducing uh, the depth of the trough, so making the emission brighter, we're actually inducing an absorption feature here with dark matter, okay? It's a very small one, but what it's suggesting is all of those heating effects are pretty much nullified by the change in the heating efficiency. No longer can we use the depth of the of this Z20 trough as an effective as such an effective probe. So those very strong limits being produced from saying that the, the trough has to be of a certain depth don't really apply if you make this correction to your heating efficiency. 
So these results are really pretty interesting. Um, we have to move on to the question of can an interferometer see the global signal? The answer is yes, in fact, but it requires some subtleties. Okay, there are some options and various papers here that I'm uh, putting up on these slides have uh, looked at various ways you can do this. So there's some tricks uh, involving the spatial coherence of your electric fields, other tricks uh, that uh, involve lunar occultation. So using the moon to induce a spatial difference on your otherwise homogeneous 21 centimeter sky and using this as a trick to observe it. And there've been some developments in this process, the LOFAR people are working on uh, doing this to try and measure turn on centered backgrounds. At the moment, they're in the process of um, working out or characterizing all of the foregrounds they have to deal with in this process. And of course, as we know, foregrounds are the, the big bugbear for 21 centimeter observations. The signal's very faint and the foregrounds are very strong. Um, the third technique, a bit more recently, is one of combining anisotropic maps. So if you take anisotropic maps that trace the neutral hydrogen density, things like galaxy maps and the turn and to power spectrum, um, you can use the, the difference in, the, in their anisotropies to pull out the isotropic global monopole. Okay? And there's some examples of some preliminary work here looking at the induced error on your monopole. You can see that it's very favorable around these uh, these uh, 15 to 20 redshifts, which is very, which is coincident with that trough we want to see. Okay, so that's very nice, reaching about 10% error here. Oh. Um, and oh, sorry, let me get back. Uh, I'm running out of time, so let me just finish off. Uh, so. All we wanted to talk about then is how good could an interferometer actually be at this. So we assume a standard noise formula from the radiometer equation. We assume no reduction sensitivity that obviously might be a bit dubious, but uh, we're not sure how much this will actually affect it. So we're going to go with the best case for now. And what dark matter models can actually be seen above the noise? So what look like something different to the baseline model rather than just the baseline model plus your noisy instrument? OK, um, and you can see a plot here. We were producing a minimally visible case, the dark matter model here in yellow, the baseline in black and our noise uh, put over the top. This is for HERA. OK, and you can see the kind of results we produce. These are produced by my MSc student in Po. So we're using a non-optimal channel here for B quarks, but we're already pushing the thermal relic limit, which is around just above this minus 26 point on the y-axis. SKA goes about an order of magnitude better, so that's very promising, okay? But we can make some kind of start with HERA here. Uh, we can also compare this to other methods of constraining dark matter in this epoch. The optical depth through ionization, people look at how it varies because of your dark matter additions. And um, we compare quite favorably to them. HERA is sitting right in the middle between their worst and most optimistic results, and SKA is pushing against their most optimistic uh, results and even better in some mass ranges. Uh, finally, we can compare to gamma ray studies, and the SK compares very favorably to existing Fermi lab dwarf limits. So that's very nice because the gamma rays are extremely clean measure, and they're often the sort of gold standard in this kind of indirect detection. So it's very promising that we can compete with them. So uh, I'll just leave my um, my summary and outlook. So I'll just mention the challenges here that. Uh, the main challenges are to extend this analysis to single dish experiments at the moment, because we just focus on interferometers. And obviously, the single dish is a bit less, uh, um, uh, was a, uh, a bit less controversial. Uh, uh, the sensitivity impact is going to be an issue on the interferometers. And finally, there are these funny sharp features from dark history that you might have noticed in the previous plots. You can see them one here. This edge is very sharp as it transitions through ionization, and we want to see whether those are just, and you can see it there as well, whether these are just intrinsic features of dark history or if there's something funny going on here. At the moment, it looks like they're just the result of the dark history models. We want to see if there's a problem there though. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, I just want to ask, um, is the ionization fraction and the temperature assumed to be isotropic in all of your studies? Um, so we're using an isotropic average. Okay, so, so, so you, um, have you ever considered the possibility that there could be um, an anisotropic? So there could be, um, um, this could be, could have some observable effect on the 21 centimeter power spectrum. 
it's possible um, of, on the power spectrum, certainly there'll be an effect. That is something we'd be interested in looking at in the future. Um, but as long as we're confining ourselves to the global uh, to the global signal, the anisotropy is not going to be too much of a, an issue here. Though, of course, I mean the evolution is undoubtedly anisotropic. Okay. Okay. Um, another question is: um, Have you considered the uh, have you considered the other sources of uh, other sources of, sources of heating from mostly uh, from the astro astrophysical right. processes? Yeah, so we've begun including this in our 21 centimeter modeling. Um, and uh, we initially we didn't include them because we were just uh, following some earlier studies that didn't either. And uh, they gave a kind of, I guess, a cleaner view since you're not worried about all of your astrophysical parameters getting in the way as well. But we definitely want to check whether or not um, your assumptions about the baseline model make it easier or harder to spot a dark matter effect. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joff, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, and I do have a few questions along the way. And uh, there, the, the first question is: you, you show a cross section benchmark plot, mm. and that value seems to be very high to me, and uh, look like it should be already excluded by CMB. Uh, do you mind to reverse back to the slide oh, sure. uh, for the benchmark? Yeah. Uh, which one? Uh, fairly early. Uh, oh, fairly early. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay. I think it's yes. Those ones. I feel that those ones, because such a high injection should be. Uh, did, did Did you confront this with CMB like front ah, front day? People have. Um, I didn't show any of those results here because I was uh, interested in the twenty one centimeter case. Um, but what's worth noting is that the CMB have the same problem as these 21 centimeter results. They are very optimistic about how much energy is going to be injected. So that's something we'd like to look at if, uh, if possible in the future, whether the revised, um, uh, the revised uh, efficiency functions make a difference there. I suspect they'll have quite a substantial difference. Okay, yeah, because the, C, the power spectrum of CMB has been measured quite accurately yes. with front. So yes. should, yeah. But those, though, the results they produce for those limits do scale with the efficiency that they assume. Okay, I see, I see. And the other thing is, uh, I just wonder why people are so, I mean, why people are so fancy about sterilized neutrino? Why this, this is so popular? I mean, I, I think you are the correct person to ask. Yeah. Uh, well, the sterile neutrino is attractive because it's just, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, sort of a, a minimal divergence from the standard model. You know, it's just another neutrino. So it's, it's, it's got a natural feel about it, I guess. Um, in terms of this kind of uh, detection method, the, the sterile neutrinos are great because they're, uh, they decay and they're very, um, they're pretty much in the exact energy band you'd want to excite hydrogen because they're usually a couple of keV. I see, I see. But wouldn't that additional species would uh, sort of uh, boost up the ineffective so that it's being highly constrained? Right. Uh, the, the sterile neutrino has been extremely constrained. I mean, as you can see, these uh, some of these papers are pretty old, the ones, uh, results I showed with the sterile neutrinos. Where did they go? Um, yeah, but the sterile neutrino has, uh, uh, yeah, so this is a 2007 one. The sterile neutrino has had a lot of its parameter space erased. And there's still some people who argue that there's room, but I, I don't know how seriously to take them. I see, I see. And the other question is that you talk about this thermal relics of the injection of energy from dark matter. And I wonder, uh, did, uh, did you compute the full spectrum, full energy spectrum of it? And what, what does it look like? Uh, sorry, the uh, power spectrum. So, uh, no, no, the full energy spectrum. Like, oh, yes, of course. Is that like yes. a thermal, thermal uh, spectrum? Yeah. No, no, we don't, yeah. we don't use, uh, so we use full energy spectra for Monte Carlo calculations in all of this. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're okay. pretty, mm -hmm. um, they're not, they're sort of power law E, but they're, they're quite complicated. I see, I see. Okay, okay. I think the last question is, is this, uh, what is the code you use? Like, uh, the, the, I mean, the code which you use. Uh, do you remind me the the name of the code you use? Dark in your history. 
Oh, yeah, dark history, yes. Is this dark history code an uh, analytical code or a semi numerical code? Or what is the, ah, I mean, so I, and it's... also, the, what is the regime? What is the regime of Russian that it operates? Yeah. Ah, okay. So dark history is meant to operate all the it's meant to be accurate down from about redshift a thousand. Um, it oper it's pretty much uh, um, it's quite heavily numerical. So it uses some semi-analytical ingredients like the baseline reanalyzation models. But then the technique is that uh, a huge number of uh, the code itself runs just by interpolation tables, basically. There's just huge amounts of interpolated data, which is probably why not too many people have worked with it so far, because you need about 20 gigs of RAM just to, <laughs> to get the damn thing to run. <laughs> I see, I see. But if you change something internally, like change some physical model internally, that it does, uh, according to what you said, it does like make a new semi and uh, semi numerical simulation and then interpolate based on that. Is, is that how it works? Um, well, theoretically, the dark, uh, the dark history people would be able to do that. The code itself couldn't. The code itself is basically using finished interpolation tables. So it has a sort of inflexibility about it. Um, we want to explore how possible it is to extend it, though, because the only the only difficulty that makes it inflexible there is the efficiency functions, because they're the significant the significant physics is all inside them. I see, I see. Okay, but mm -hmm. they are in a way they're quite general because um, you what you essentially do is you have an efficiency function for an electron of a given energy. It doesn't really ask how you got that electron. So you can in include your own distribution of electrons and then simply use that as your um, your sort of baseline injection to integrate over. Okay, I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Thanks. That was a great talk, Jeff. And um, thanks. Yeah, I'll see you guys next week, I guess. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye.